We were nearly crushed to death. And I kept on thinking about the Hajj in Mecca when hundreds of people are trampled to death. And this was a very real possibility. I would say there was easily 100 to 200,000 people in a place where maybe 5,000 people should be. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A dark food. Very nice. The first 10,000 pictures are your worst. Let's sit down. Let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to another episode of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where, as always, it is my honour and privilege to interview the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows, and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession. Before I introduce our guest today, would you like to maximise your photography in one short email? Like you, my goal is to improve. So, every Friday you can receive a handful of bullet points highlighting things I've discovered from speaking with the best photographers in the world. It could be software recommendations, articles, book quotes, videos we've shared, all are designed to challenge you expand your photography knowledge and keep you ahead of the competition. It has become extremely popular since we started this podcast. It's completely free, very short, won't clog up your inbox, but could make a big difference to your photography. If you'd like to receive that, head on over to thestandoutcompany.com forward slash podcast. That is thestandoutcompany.com forward slash podcast. Drop in your email and you'll receive the very next issue. Similarly, this show is all about you. Is there a world-class photographer that you want to hear in conversation? If so, let us know at the same place, thestandoutcompany.com forward slash podcast, and we'll do all we can to get them on the show for you. For now, thank you as always for tuning in. Let me introduce today's guest. My guest today is Art Wolf. Yes, the Art Wolf. That is at Art Wolf on Instagram and ArtWolf.com on the World Wide Webs. That is Wolf with an E. W O L F E. Art was born in Seattle, Washington, and still calls the city home to this day. He graduated from the University of Washington with bachelor's degrees in fine arts and art education in 1975, where he studied under professors such as Jacob Lawrence. His photography career has spanned five decades, a remarkable testament to the durability and demand for his images, his expertise, and his passionate advocacy for the environment and indigenous culture. During that time, he has worked on every continent, in hundreds of locations, and on a dazzling array of projects. In 1978, he published his first book, Indian Baskets of the Northwest Coast. Since 1988, he has published at least one book a year. 1997 alone saw seven titles in the United States and abroad. He has released over 100 books in eight languages, including the popular titles The New Art of Photographing Nature, The Art of the Photograph and Vanishing Act, as well as award-winning titles The Human Canvas and The High Himalaya. Art has also ventured into the world of television production. In May 2007, Art made his public television debut with the high-definition series Art Wolf's Travels to the Edge, an intimate and upbeat series that offers unique insights on nature, culture and a realm of digital photography. Like you, I have been a huge admirer of Art for a long, long time, so to have him here on the show was a real honour. We discuss a whole range of topics, including the beautiful views from his home office, his ability to plan ahead and take action in order to protect his staff and his business, his views on entrepreneurship in photography, controlling his destiny, preparation, unique perspectives, drones, you name it, we cover it. So please sit back and enjoy my conversation with the delightful Art Wolf. 
let's be ever so official and i will say art wolf it is an enormous pleasure to say welcome to the show my pleasure to be here with you matthew thanks for asking me it's no honestly the pleasure is all mine now art you're at that wonderful place in your career and i spoke to another photographer earlier today and you're both in the place where other people describe you and your work so wikipedia describe you as an american photographer and conservationist best known for color images and landscapes wildlife and native cultures creative live describe you as a nature and conservation photographer with a background in fine art but how do you personally describe you and your work well i i think being a generalist doesn't sound glamorous but in fact that's the way i see myself and often when i'm giving talks i'll say i'll shoot or photograph anything besides graduations and weddings everything else is a potential subject to me and though it's more important as one builds their career to attach themselves to a specific style or subject for clarity, I embrace everything as I've progressed and matured over my my years of being a photographer. So in other words, I'm a curious soul. I love all things as long as I can take a new uh, slant on it, uh, try to say something different than maybe predecess- predecessors have done in the past. So that's, uh, that's dodging the question. I basically am a generalist that is curious and I try to put an artistic slant on regardless the subject on everything I do. May I may I ask, when I've been speaking with other photographers, the subject, and it wasn't a direction I necessarily intended to go with photographers, but the subject of work environments has become a particular topic in terms of office space and how you like to work. What does your home office look like where we're speaking today? This is literally in my bedroom. I... Uh, I live in on a West Coast standard in a Northwest standard. I live in a very old home. It was built in 1910. And so, uh, believe it or not, that's old. Uh, 200 years ago, it was only First Nations that lived in and around this region. Um, So why I say that is that about 20 years ago, I basically took off the last floor of this old Tudor-style house and made a giant room that's very spacious and is as large as the house I grew up in, just the bedroom alone. And so I look westward to water, trees, and mountains. I've seen orcas from my bedroom or from my bed. Sitting on my bed, I've watched orcas swim by. Uh, And so this is where my desk is. And then two floors down is my office. And that's where uh, employees will come and go during the course of the day. And we communicate through intercom. I'm running up and down stairs all day long to stay not in fit, but it just happens that I stay fit because I've got two flights of stairs that I'm perpetually going up and down. So that's my workspace when I'm home. But before COVID hit, I would say I was home between 40 to 50 days a year. And the rest of the time I'm on the road. I'm pleased that you mentioned COVID, actually, because one of the things that you've been doing during your time is tequila time and pathways to creativity. Now, for those who haven't seen tequila time, it's a live stream on IGTV and Facebook live every Thursday at 530. Would you mind explaining a bit more about what that is? Well, you know, it it's a way of reaching out directly to fans or people that were interested in my work. Think of this as, and I know this would be true with me, I own a lot of books. And so, and multiple books from various photographers or painters or whatever. And you only experience the artist through the work they're doing. There's no connection personally to them. And I think in today's world, if you can connect directly with the people that have supported you buying a book, or if you want to cultivate a new audience, the best way to do it is a live, direct communication. And people are loving that. And they, and I think they delight in realizing there's personality behind the photographer that 
the, you know, before we meet somebody, we only can two dimensionalize what they must be like. Once you start to see them entering, uh, interacting, and maybe drinking uh, tequila is a good way of dumbing you down, so there's no airs of superiority or arrogance. It's just a way to become human in front of people that have followed your career. And I actually enjoy it. I enjoy the spontaneous engagement and also being real because I think I am just like everybody else. You know, I, I do everything everybody else does, but I'm also type A personality and I like to work. I grew up in a very modest economic family, and so work was instilled in all of us, uh, meaning my brother and my sister. So, you know, it was a family of workers. How long into the lockdown situation did you begin tequila time? Just some context for listeners. Over here in the UK, we're on week 13, I believe. I'm not entirely sure how many weeks in you are but how many weeks into the lockdown situation did you start tequila time probably about well let's see uh last thursday was our ninth episode so there you go there's over two months and we're in june now so two months ago we would have been in what april and probably so it would have been early april so it was very early into the lockdown situation that you started doing it Right. I think we got locked down sometime in mid-March. Uh, I think more curiously, I started Pathways to Creativity in mid-February when I saw what the potential was coming. I actually was, somebody sent to me a Stanford study that really estimated, and this was in February, early February, estimated the potential death toll in the United States with the coming virus. And I took that to heart. I uh, completed the last two, well, I completed two workshops, one in Moab, Arizona, uh, Utah, and one in Carmel, California. And then I canceled way ahead all the other workshops uh, this year, canceled by delaying them. And I started working on Pathways because I knew that if this thing was going to last as long as the Stanford study predicted, we would need to create a revenue stream that shored up our defenses. And so I started working on that early on. And it's taken, and I'm after this interview, I'll be dictating several more tutorials that are part of the 28 tutorials that I've created. 28 unique one-and-a-half-hour lectures is a lot of content to create. So I started on that early, and to yeah. Tequila Time with Art was started, must have been in um, early April. You've led me on very beautifully to what my question was going to be, actually, which is, has that ability to adapt quickly and that drive and want to create and come up with new ideas been something that served you well throughout your entire career? It has. It has. I, If you can visualize a young boy maybe seven years old, um, playing and walking through the forested uh, ravines of Seattle in the 50s and the 60s uh, with a little bird book, a little mammal book, a little tree book. And I was self-educating myself about every bird that I was seeing, every little mammal I was seeing, all the different types of trees, flowers, ferns, so forth. I was very focused kid. I had an agenda. And by the time I was 13, I was painting pictures and selling them to my school teachers. So my parents that always kind of gave parameters to my older brother and older sister and curfews and all that, they just left me alone. They said, this guy's got his own agenda. Let's not interfere with what he's doing. So I was always that kind of self-directed, focused person. I'm sorry, I have to journey back. You were selling pictures to your school teachers. I was. I was framing <laughs> them. I was, they were bringing in little black and white photographs of the farmhouses that they grew up in the Midwest. There was two or three of them. And they would bring in these little black and white draw uh, photographs, and I would render them into watercolor paintings and 
and put old cars and all that. And then I would uh, mat and frame them and bring them to school and sell it to them for around $30. And that was when I was 13 or 14. <laughs> That's one of the best stories of a uh, of youth and entrepreneurship I think I've heard in a long, long time. <laughs> oh. Well, Matthew, and that gave me the confidence that uh, going forward, I could possibly make a living whatever, from whatever I was creating. So I never thought of myself as working for somebody else. I always thought I'm going to, uh, and I mean, I'm in retrospect, we all have clarity, but I knew even back then, and my father was an independent, uh, small, small businessman. He had his own photography, wedding photography business and a print shop. And so he never worked for somebody else. So that kind of was instilled into me that I would be self-employed in some way, shape or form. And art and nature would be part of it. There was no doubt in my mind. I'm pleased you mentioned the business side of your work because it's something I want to touch on a little bit later on. But may we just look at your early career? So you graduated with a Bachelor of Arts, uh, Fine Arts degree, I beg your pardon, from the University of Washington. What did your years of training look like at the University of Washington? Well, when you're at the University of Washington or any major institution, you're required to take a bunch of uh, different classes. And I took a lot of different classes before I finally declared being an art major. So I had, you know, everything from geom. Well, the math, math was not my long suit, uh, nor was physics, but science I was keen on. And all the other things that one is required, grammar, you know, English and all this, they try to round you out. So you have all these other classes disciplines that you're exposed to and the happiest day was when finally about the fourth year into college i declared a major and in fact i declared a double major i was not only a fine art painting major but i also was art education and that education degree which took an additional two years really profoundly helped me simply because i like so many other people had that in, uh, natural fear of speaking in front of a group of people. And that kind of broke me down or broke that barrier down. And how so? When I graduated, I spent one year as a substitute art teacher in the school district. And every day I had to take control of that class. And even though I was very young and sometimes I'd teach senior high school and the age differential wasn't much, I still had to take control of the class, and I realized that if I could exude confidence, uh, then people would listen. And that was a, an emotional, mental barrier I had to get through because then later on, and that was only one year as a substitute teacher, the next year I started working with magazine editors and book editors and that confidence of projecting and walking in and shaking somebody's hand and looking straight into their eye was all part and parcel of what I got out of being trained as a teacher. That must have been a real learning curve and a real challenge. How old were you when you were teaching high school kids? Well, it took me seven years. I got straight into college right out of high school. I would presume I was definitely in my uh, early 20s, maybe 21, 22. No, I would have been about around 23 years old, 24 years old. Before we spoke, I wanted to try and get a different perspective that perhaps someone else that hasn't spoke to you has managed to find. So I spoke to a mutual friend of ours, and I'll try and see if you can guess who it is. If I said the words animals on the edge you would say the person is animals on the edge oh my god uh you're now talking to a 68 year old man who has those <laughs> sh short-term memory uh gaps you know what i'm saying is that and it happens it'll happen to you when uh, that short-term memory and accessing short-term memory 
uh, animals what, what, on What's the worrying, air. Art? I'm 36. I'm already starting to get that, so there's no hope for me going <laughs> forward. Well, listen, tell you what, let me, fill the, <laughs> let me fill the gap for you. It is a wonderful, lovely, very generous man called Chris Weston. Oh, yes. I saw Chris uh, earlier this year down there, actually, uh, in Patagonia. Yes, he mentioned. Now, when I spoke to him, he said, Art has an amazing ability that extends above and beyond photography. He is a true artist with the ability to inject design into the photograph. Now, he was referring to your work in general, but one of the things he said I must speak to you about, if nothing else, is the human canvas. Now, for anyone that hasn't seen the human canvas, A, they have not lived, but B, would you mind explaining what it is? Yes, you know, well, prior to the creation of the Human Canvas, I had been working for two years on a program called Travels to the Edge. And ultimately, that show was broadcast in 70 countries around the world. And it was basically over the shoulder going into everywhere from uh, various countries in Africa, South America, I mean, the entire planet from the Arctic to the Antarctic. And the cameras were rolling and I would spontaneously react to what was unfolding. So that was a great mental calisthenic and it was a really strong show simply because it was right in the moment. There was no staging and the viewers could see that. That under, got, um, that was funded for two years by Microsoft and Canon USA. And then 2008 happened, which was a world a crisis financially and so the funding for that show which was around two million dollars ended for the following year and so suddenly i had time on my hands there was a void and because i expected that show to be funded a third year and a fourth year and you know that's what i was expecting so suddenly i had this time on my hands and i had been it had been percolating in the back of my mind that it would be – because I had – in most of my career, I had been really traveling in a lot of remote cultures around the world. And so clothing has been optional in many of the cultures in equatorial Africa and South America. So I was very used to seeing naked people everywhere. And I wasn't raised really religious, so I don't put any kind of – negativity on nudity. I find that our Western cultures are a little too purient. At any rate, that I digress. In the back of my mind, I wanted to take the human form and do something different with it because the, the cliche is old, straight, white men naturally will start to photograph young, nubile, naked women under the guise of art in their studios. It happens all the time. And I don't want to be a walking cliche about that. And so, nor am I straight. So, but I didn't want anybody to look, oh yeah, now Art's doing nudes. It's such a cliche that he's doing nudes. So I struggled with that because I wanted to take the human form and I say human form over nudes because it sounds a little more, um, artistic anyways. And so I started photographing parts of the human form with dramatic light, trying to create landscapes and abstracts out of our bodies. And then I would go out into sand dunes around the world or into areas like lava has a way of reflecting light that looks like human parts. And I started investing a lot of time and energy in doing that, and I was working on it for about a year, in addition to all the other travels and workshops I was doing. And I was pretty happy with where it was going. It was going to be called The Sensuous Earth. But then I started seeing some photos of other people that looked like the, what I was doing with the human form. And I just ended it right there because usually, Matthew, I work on any project for every, anywhere from seven to nine years. And I didn't want to invest nine years on a book that looked like it was derivative of somebody else. And so I 
stopped and I went back to the drawing board, so to speak. I looked through my files and I kept on looking at a lot of the tribal work and their tribal designs and how they adorned themselves during ceremonial occasions. And so I drew from my own past experience and catalog and I started buying big rolls of paper and spending hours on end at night with paper that was maybe uh, nine meters, four meters long by three meters wide. They were all backdrops that you could buy in a photographic studio. And then I'd hand paint very elaborate uh, tribal designs out of my own imagination. Then I would bring in humans and spray paint them white and black, lay them over my designs and hand paint them into place. So it's not really sexually charged or even sensual. It's more theatrical and cultural. And that began the human canvas. So literally, the humans became the canvas. I'm I'm just in in awe of of how you found that journey. And and you said you spend seven to nine years on a project of that extent. Wow. Yeah. So I have done a lot of books over the years. I... There's a lot of things I cannot do very well. I don't speak foreign languages. I, I'm not a great cook. I, I blah, 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 blah. But what I am fairly good at is compartmentalizing projects. And almost like a juggler that ha- needs a bunch of balls in there, I actually can work on multiple books at one time. For instance, right now, I'm working on seven books. As I travel, I can see this that could go in that book and right next to it could be something that goes in it. So I'm pretty good at keeping these things all in alignment. And I refer to my notes. So I'm very, very, very organized. And so I can work on a book for nine years, but I'm also working on a bunch of other things for nine years to, uh, to, to, I guess the word is amortize the cost of development. Because if you, there's no, not a publisher in the world that could hire me for nine years to go out and do a book that would ever make money. There, there's no way. So I self fund books by doing multiple books at one time and by teaching workshops or taking fairly well off, financially well off people on private tours. But I piece together a book project. And the, and the other, Part of that is, and if you watch Tequila Time, you've probably heard me say this, I try to do books that have world in scope. In other words, whatever I'm shooting in Seattle, I just as easily could be shooting in Manchester or Johannesburg or Sydney or, or, or. So I look at the world as a unit from which I do these books, and I show the commonality of humans and cultures as well. I'm pleased you mentioned books because one of the other things which Chris said to me which really resonated was that you are an astute businessman and someone that will not suffer mediocrity and that really struck a chord with me because I think a lot of artists struggle with the business side of being an artist whereas you seem someone who is very much in control of your career it's not dictated for example by the next inquiry that comes through the door when you began your career did you have a plan and a vision for what it would look like no and i would refute the fact and uh i mean chris is a very nice man and very complimentary but he's echoing what other people have said that have never met me i would and I'm, this is not false modesty. This is just my own personal, honest statement. I think I suck as a businessman. <laughs> I just work really hard. I just work really hard, and I'll let the chips fall where they may. But I'm not that shrewd in mapping a course. A colleague of mine, Franz Lanting, who's Dutch by birth, lives in uh, Santa Cruz, He's very careful and cautious financially. I'm far less so. I don't even pay attention to money. I just, it's all about the work to me. And I always have felt that if I work really hard and if I'm prolific, well, then there should be a way of making a living from it. But I am not a great businessman. Any other profession 
if I work as hard as I do in photography, I'd be very, very wealthy. I would be very, very wealthy. But I'm not. I've got a good staff, and that is perhaps part of the, the magic is I've got two different women that have worked individually for me for 30 years. I've got two other employees, one that's worked for me for 11 years and now one for five. And so they work as a team. And the, uh, one of the ladies does all the uh, – then we have an accountant as well. I don't even know how much I make. I have not – written a check, filled out a form. I haven't done any of that in probably 15 years. So purely I focus on the art and the travel, the teaching, but money and, um, uh, you know, checks and balances I could care less about. Are there things that you will say no to in your career that allow you to focus on what you want to achieve? The only things that we say no, we meaning probably my uh, executive assistant, she hates that title, but that's what she is, <laughs> Chris Eckhoff. She's worked for me for 30 years, and she basically is between me and the queries for me to come and give a talk to this photo club or this group, and she also works with me on the calendar and so the, the only times we say no is when I can't possibly do an event and or it's too small of a venue for me, me to travel all the way to Detroit to talk to a high school class. Those are the only no's we give. You know, we say yes way more than we say no. And, but you know, historically, when I was approaching editors in my – mid to late 20s and all through the, the 30s, I was pitching stories to magazines. And so th I was hoping for yeses. They weren't pitching stories to me. I would always come with a story planned for that specific magazine. That whole industry really took a nosedive. And so there's, no, a, there's not a lot of money in magazine articles. There's certainly no money in stock photography. So basically, the money today is coming through teaching workshops and providing content. And then the books, which are labors of love, uh, do generate income, but probably never. Well, I think some of them pay off over the long run, but I don't really keep track of that. Has there it's ever, all true. It's all true. <laughs> Has there ever been a, a sliding doors moment, so to speak, in your career where had you made a different choice, perhaps your career could have looked very different and taken a different direction? Uh, yeah, I mean, I left working for National Geographic early on in my career when I had a story published and they owned the photos that they published. And that went counter to my belief that the artist owns their work. But National Geographic, and I would presume other big, strong magazines, had the control. If you want to work for our magazine, we, whatever we publish, we own the copyright. And I just, that just rubbed against me the wrong way. And so I started working on books. I left working with magazines and start working on books where I own my own copyright. I think one of the... So, so if I had stayed, just to answer that point then, mm. had I stayed with Geographic and really cultivated a long-term relationship, uh, it could have been a very different career. But in fact, I think the photographers that work for Geographic basically have security until they're the managing editor leaves and a new regime comes in and maybe a new editor will bring in his own stable of photographers and so you, those photographers were vulnerable to the whims of the new editor coming in whereas i basically controlled my own destiny i didn't have you know i wasn't and i know several photographers very highly re regarded photographers that suddenly were out the door at Geographic when they thought they would be working there the rest of their lives. So 
by building up my own career, I had my own support network, whereas they basically had the lifeline to uh, National Geographic. It seems to be one of the themes when I'm speaking to successful photographers, that uh, that ability to to take action and make those difficult decisions. I spoke to a lovely man called Timothy Allen this morning, and he he was a photojournalist for six years with one of the large papers in London, and he felt exactly the same as you, and he needed to go and explore his own path. How many countries have you travelled to throughout your career? So, Matthew... I don't know how many countries I've gone to, and I don't know how many days I travel. I don't know how many books I've done. I don't, I'm not like a bean counter, you know, so I don't even know. I, uh, the staff counted up something like 60 or 70 countries 10 years ago, but I don't even know because, you know, some people travel to every country on earth so they can tell everybody they've traveled to every country on earth. I don't travel to tell people what I do. You know, I'm just not wired that way. I'm my own, you know, I'm not trying to impress people with how many countries I've been to. So I don't even know. (laughs) I don't, I just, it's not the way I think. What does your preparation look like before you embark on a long trip abroad in terms of, working out where you want to go, but also with an eye on what you're going to take with you in terms of equipment? Well, basically, had you asked that question 30 years ago, it probably would be a different answer. But today, I have such a broad knowledge of the planet, the cultures, the wildlife. My preparation is already embedded in my brain. And if there's holes in that, then I've got a huge library And if there's holes in the library, then I've got the internet. And so most of my career, half of my career, we didn't have the internet. So we were reliant on faxes and trying to find somebody that could be an interpreter or a guide that could get me into, for instance, orangutans in Sumatra. Because prior, I would not leave Seattle without knowing somebody was at the airport waiting for me. Simply put, I recognized early on, if I'm going to build a career, if I have employees, I can't arrive in Sumatra scratching my butt wondering what to do next. I had to be ready to go. And so I'm very time conscious. I'm very prolific, but I'm also time conscious. I never was the backpacker that just kind of was traveling at the whims of, you know, my mood. I had an agenda And I would get in, get out, and get back and go again. And so I am very prepared when I travel. I know what I want, but I also always have allowed openness so that serendipity, the unexpected, which could be the best shots on the entire shoot, I'm not closed off to not even see the possibilities. So there's the the gentle walk. You have an agenda. You have ideas. But – you also look back and you constantly are saying, okay, I didn't expect that. That's better than what I was looking at. So I think there's the magic of of being open enough for the serendipity. You talked about something really lovely in episode two or three, I think it was, of Tequila Time. And you said earlier this year you were in Komodo Island in Indonesia photographing Komodo dragons. And you said you had the camera on a tethered pull with wheels underneath so that you could get close to the dragons because you were on a 16 mil lens. What is the most extreme or perhaps inventive solution you found to capture something unique? Because a lot of people would just, you know, if they had a 16 mil lens would just go, Oh, I can't get close to those. So I'll leave it. Whereas you didn't do that. Well, I think I learned from, uh, I learned, about the Komodo possibilities from a shoot two years ago when I was up in the Canadian Arctic and in Hudson Bay, which is very cold water, at the mouth of the Churchill River, a bunch of beluga white whales come in. You know, they're only, they're called the sea canary. They're only maybe 12 feet long, uh, four meters long. And I tried to get in the water and be dragged by my foot to photograph them underwater. And it was like 
a lesson in what not to do. So the second day, and we're working from Zodiacs. So we went to a hardware store in Churchill, and we bought a, a pole that was like a long brush to clean high windows. We cut off the brush. We gerrymander or rigged a way of attaching an underwater housing to the pole. And then I, the next day, we sunk the pole and the underwater housing, and I had a rope around my wrist behind the Zodiac, and we started driving. And that was such a curiosity to the uh, belugas that at one point we had like 12 belugas following wherever my underwater housing went. They were following it like salmon to a lure. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And there was, and and uh, we, I had programmed the camera to take a picture every second. So I didn't even know what I was getting. I was just using it, and I was like, "All oh, these whales were following this underwater housing," and <laughs> that that was uh, pretty remarkable. And did you get the shot that you were looking for? I did. Excellent. Now I read a stat, and it said that. There are 1.8 billion images uploaded to the internet every day. So that's 657 billion a year. And bear in mind, this was a stat from 2014. So I dread to think what that statistic is now. What techniques have you developed over the years that enable you to find a new perspective on something? Huh. That's uh, a uh, great... I'll tell you what led me to this question because I saw a a video of you and you'd shot forgive me I'm not entirely sure where it was it was an an old abandoned town somewhere in the US and you'd taken a shot of a house through the back of a an old abandoned car and and I remember looking at the two comparisons that you'd taken you'd taken a shot of the car um in the foreground and then the shot through the window and the difference was it was night and day, and that's what made me think, you know, that's that's something really unique to to search for something different. Well, I have, I, I think to answer that, Matthew, I think that I've lived long enough and done this enough that I've got all sorts of ideas in the back of my head, and, you know, no man's an island. You know, I look and I'm inspired by the works of all sorts of other artists, painters and illustrators and photographers. And so I love pouring over the work of other people <clears throat> with the idea that I'm not going to plagiarize them, but I'm going to be inspired by their work, and maybe I can take it into my own unique perspective. And so it's a combination of knowledge of what you can do, looking at the situation, the subject, the light, the positioning, the all those kind of things. And I've had, I think, my background in Painting, which required a lot of graphic design, opened up my imagination quite profoundly. So I have a lot of, not tricks, but perspectives that I can draw upon almost instantly when given a new circumstance. And I think the human canvas really furthered that. And in a book called Earth is My Witness, I was building platforms and getting above cultures and shooting straight down, trying to look at the culture in a different way. This is prior to drones being available. But with drones, you know, the quality of the image may be far less than what you could do if you're there actually looking through the camera. And so different perspectives always separated the wor new work I was doing from something I had done previously. I don't want, in other words, to replicate the highlights of my career again and again and again. I'd rather take on a new subject and apply what I learned from other projects and try to uh, combine the new subject with uh, a different way of seeing it. Uh, you know, I don't enter contests. I've never entered a photo contest in my life. I am my own harshest reviewer and critic so the drive comes from an inner uh, place that compels me to not be stationary with career with vision 
concepts just to keep moving forward. And it's not that I'm a miserable person. I, I love, you know, I can look back and in fact, uh, tomorrow night I'll be talking about my favorite photos, which probably two years from now will be a different set of favorite photos. But I, uh, I always thought if I kept that carrot slightly beyond my reach, it keeps me moving forward. And occasionally you got to taste that carrot for the reward. So striking that balance, because quite honestly, my biggest fear is akin to writer's block, where you run out of ideas, you run out of inspiration, and you walk away from the camera. And I never wanted to do that. I, well, you know, my best years creatively, creativity wise, I believe, is lies ahead. And so as long as you have that concept, you're constantly being compelled to go out the door. I don't want to be a retired artist. I want to die uh, in the mouth of a bear. No, that's a joke. It <laughs> I could mean, be true. But... It'd be a great way to go, though, let's be honest. You could be going out in style. Um, yeah. You mentioned drones very briefly then. How much, uh, to what extent will you use drones in your work now? Um, I'm working on a book on international wildlife and... Um, Basically, I'm going to include not a lot of drone shots, but where appropriate, I'm using drones. And I'm not flying the drone. I'm working with a pilot where I have the monitor and I'm clicking the picture and I'm saying left or right. I don't know that I could fly the drone and really hone in the composition, nor am in today's world qualified to be a pilot of a drone. So I work with a pilot that's certified pilot. The drones are uh, an interesting thing because all young men want a drone. And yet, every day, more restrictions, more restrictions. So it's a collision of desire and reality. And it didn't take very long for that to happen. Some idiot flew a drone into the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone, which happens to be, along with Old Faithful, the most iconic physical landmarks and suddenly drones were banned in all national parks so then other areas and so you have to, i mean and yet people love the people that complain about drones are the people that just love uh home planet you know attenborough's great series they love watching that but they'll be the first to complain if they're out in the forest and they hear a drone so there's there's this disconnect with reality and how people are viewing what they love. Have you ever found yourself perhaps in a situation, because obviously a lot of your work is, perhaps maybe all of your work is on location, and there are so many variables when you're out in the field. Have you ever found yourself in a circumstance where conditions out of your control could have affected the outcome of your work? Well, I, I, I thought to myself about that, and I can't, the only thing that comes to mind, and I've been, you know, if I shoot, if I have a bunch of different books that really are a broad range, which I do, then I feel like I could trip and fall to earth, and before I hit the ground, inadvertently take a picture that's going to wind up in a book someday. But <laughs> last year... In March of last year, I took a group of people to India for Holi. And I had been early on to Holi 15 years ago when I and my assistant and an old Japanese couple were there. And we were the only outsiders at an ancient temple photographing people enjoying Holi, which is the age of – or the day when – they throw paint and color, and it's a way of welcoming the spring. It's a Hindu tradition. Last year, there were tens of thousands of more people, mostly young Indians, with iPhones. And I had my group there. And in previous encounters, I've only traveled with myself and an assistant. We were cr nearly crushed to death. And the... And I kept on thinking about the Hajj in Mecca 
when hundreds of people are trampled to death and 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 this was a very real possibility the the way people were being herded through tiny narrow passages i could be moved without touching the ground from the sheer mass of humanity around me and if somebody had fallen ahead there would have been a domino effect and hundreds and thousands of people were pressing in from behind i grabbed the one participant uh, and grabbed her and pulled her through the crowd up against the wall. And I said, we're just going to stay here. And I had like 10 other people and Gabrielle Jacon, who's worked with me for 30 years. They were all spread out over this temple complex. There was, I would say there was easily a hundred to 200,000 people in a place where maybe 5,000 people should be. And so that was the first time in my life that I felt completely out of my ability to save myself other than to get up against a wall and just wait and wait and wait and hope that nobody else is getting injured. So needless to say, that would be the first and last time I would take anybody to the holy. And yet next year we'll do a event. We'll take people to the Kumela, which is this big gathering of Hindus along the Ganges where millions of people will come. But it's such a broad stretch of river that the fear of being trampled to death is far, far, it's not even an issue for me. But I would never take people back to holy. I'm glad you, well, firstly, I'm glad that you were okay, first of all. But also, I'm glad that you mentioned your teaching side of your work, because it's something that you are clearly extremely passionate about. From I was quite interested to hear your journey from the moment you take the memory card out of the camera to when you deliver what is your final image. What does your process look like? Yeah, it's it's pretty fast. I mean, whether I'm in Africa or in India or South America or Antarctica or wherever it is, by before I go to bed, I'll have uploaded it onto my computer, pulled it into a collection worked on it, and then I go to bed. And so, because tomorrow I might shoot 2,000 new images, and the following day I might shoot 2,000 new images, and I don't want to come home with 10,000 images and dump them into an archive that's already, you know, all we spend money on is buying more memory. So I have learned to be extremely decisive about what I keep and what I don't, and by the time I get back to Seattle, it's been edited. They've been worked on. They're in folders, and I hand it to the staff, and they upload it to the main file. And there's no looking back. And because nobody in my office, though they've worked for me for a very long time, wants to edit my work. They don't want that responsibility. And so I take it on. And so... And it makes flying from Europe back to Seattle that much easier because I'm so focused on editing and deleting and working. Will you ever, you've almost answered the question, I think, will you ever revisit an image that you've perhaps taken 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and re-edit something? Constantly in the last two months, I've done that with Pathways to Creativity. In fact, it's been such a cathartic, great experience. I haven't gone back through the million plus slides that are in cabinets in the office because I'm not, I don't have the time. We've gotten rid of our big light tables and our loops. We have one little light table and one little loop. And so all the slides I've taken in the first half of my career, the first two thirds of my career are in file cabinets that take up half my office. But what I have looked at is every folder of every slot, uh, image that I took in the age of digital. That goes back, I think, 10, 12 years. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images I've poured over and pulled out photos that I'd never had the vision to do nor the talent to work on, and now I do. Now I can work pretty effectively in Lightroom and transform an image and drop it into a, a new lecture, and I've loved doing that. It's just 
It's like going on a trip. You're looking for something to shoot. Now I'm on the trip into the archive, finding new things and new visions and photos that I would never have considered before. I have the skills to revitalize, to bring to life. Have you ever perhaps looked at an image that you've taken previously? And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking this, because quite often I will look at an image I have shot maybe six, seven, eight years ago, and it won't be what I would have done now, but I quite enjoy looking at it because then I can see my personal development as a photographer. Will you ever ed re-edit something that you once thought was the final image? All the time. And I throw them away. <laughs> I throw them away. I've thrown away hundreds of thousands of photos. And in fact, early on, and I've got photos in the cabinets that are among the first photos I ever shot. But I've looked at uh, many of them that I thought were the best work at the time. And I thought they were great. And then I look at them and I, it's like I would ask is it possible that a slide, a positive slide, could actually go out of focus with time? And the answer is no. <laughs> you just didn't have, you didn't have a great lens. You didn't have, you know, I mean, when I first started out, Matthew, our ISOs were 50, 25, and 50. And if you're a wildlife photographer, it had to be a very slow-moving animal to get it in focus. And so, you know, the success rate was pretty low. And so I've got a lot of stationary animals that are somewhat sharp, but the, te the, the lenses weren't that great, but they were the, the best at the time. But they're useless to me now. You know, I can't even consider them. The only reasons we really keep images in the file, is there's three. A, it would take too much time to get rid of them. B, they're archivally important. They're tribes that no longer exist or have now switched into Western clothing. Or they're a historical record of my life. Otherwise, most of them are useless. They're just languishing in the files because we, didn't, we don't have the time. It would take one person probably a year and a half to throw out hundreds of thousands of photos of redundancy that we never need. And redundancy was the rule of the day because if you shot positive images and you could never confirm on site that you got it, you would shoot more and more and more. And you'd wind up with, you know, two rolls of film on almost identical, identical subjects. Whereas today, you click, you look, you confirm, and maybe you shoot two or three more and then you move on. So even at that, then I'm still shooting 2,000 clicks a day with digital but a much broader spectrum. So out of 2,000 images, I would probably keep a couple hundred. A couple hundred images per day is not bad. I'm not shooting randomly, by the way. It, when I shoot 2,000, it generally means I'm shooting animals on the move. If I'm in a cultural situation or a landscape, it's far fewer photos. It's just the 2000 is generally on a great day on safari when you're shooting all day long and shooting a lot of animals where you're not shooting bad shots because I'm no longer shooting bad shots, but I'm shooting shots that may be marginally too dark to shoot. And I'm experimenting with uh, shutter speed length and all those kind of things. I'm pleased you mentioned what you are shooting because it, someone once described your work as for photographing beautiful scenes and you replied by saying i do photograph beauty but i also photograph destruction and carnage but i choose not to show this in the context of a book i prefer to inspire uplift and inform i really it struck a chord with me because you also went on to say that there is a, a lot of negativity through our channels and you don't want to add to that when you're publishing a book from all the images that you take, how do you decide what will make the final cut? Is it purely down to your final say? Will you show friends, family, colleagues? So that's a great question. And the answer is 
uh, Deirdre Skillman in my office, who I think maybe was the first person to react to your query. She was, yes. Um, yeah, she has been our editor, uh, queen of the archive, I would say, for 30 years. And so she, along with me, have a pretty strong idea of what photos are in the archive. I, I won't say I have a photographic memory, but I have a pretty, if you show me any photo, I'll pretty much tell you where it was shot. Maybe not what decade, but I can tell you a story around the photo. So time is the uh, strange thing. But to answer your point, Deirdre will put in her two cents, as will everybody in my office chime in. Ultimately, I can overrule everybody. I work with a publisher who also loves photography. If you get a publisher that's only about money and that's all the bottom line, then they may not share your aesthetic vision. I have one that really shares my aesthetic vision, and he will fight tooth and nail on keeping a photo in that I may not want. And I think that's a great thing because you want somebody invested to make the book as po uh, great as possible. But I'm not going to show him photos that I really don't like. You know, he can fight over the ones that I've already decided I want in the book. And then it comes down to ultimately there's so many pages and so many photos and some you've got to let go of. So it, it's, it's a collaborative effort, I would say. And I have found that in those collaborations, usually the best work comes out. I'm pleased you mentioned during that, actually, about remembering where images are taken, because it's one of the questions that was on my list to speak with you about. When I take a photograph, there's, and we joked about it earlier, we had short term memory where you can't remember, you know, where you've left your glasses or something like that. But for some reason, there is a clarity with images. And if you think how many you've taken in your lifetime, you know, when I look at an image I've taken, if it's eight, nine, ten years ago, I can remember where I was, who I was with, the street I was on, what the weather was like, smells, sounds. And that level of clarity from looking at an image is something I find fascinating about photography. And you mentioned it then. Can you remember where you were and the smells? What emotions does looking at older images bring back? Yeah, I can. And, uh, you know, I actually mentioned this on Tequila Time one day that I can remember an image, but I'm hard pressed to remember the names of people that may have just taken a workshop two weeks ago, because in those two weeks I've done another workshop. So, you know, targeting and I have to be refreshed. Whereas if I took a picture on that same trip, I can remember everything about that photo. And somebody chimed in after I mentioned that that you have a, I think it was called telegenic memory. There was a specific word they referred to the type of memory that I may have. And I didn't realize that there possibly were various types of memories people have. No, nor did I. What, what, sorry, what did you but, say the person called it? Well, I would have to look up in my uh, uh, emails. I, I, oh, okay. I don't know if it was telegenic. It was something genic memory which was really specific to people that can remember the story around the photos. And referring to the smells, I think smells are one of the strongest uh, connections to our past. I mean, obviously, a lot of people will smell smell that they may not have smelled since they were a child, but it instantly connects to their memory, their memory bank up there in the brain. And so I think smells are part of that experience. I can remember the emotions around maybe shooting this shot or that shot. And it's another fascinating thing about our minds because almost everything you've been exposed to in your lifetime is up there in that brain of yours. It's accessing that memory is really hard. And there are actually people on this planet that can remember every day uh, going back to probably when they were two or three years old. And they can recant what happened that day. And would you really want that type of memory? I, I don't think you'd want that kind of memory. 
but pe- there are people that have that. I think that having the ability to remember the story is huge for me. Not knowing what decade it was is less important. And n- remembering the names. I mean, I, I may come in contact with, um, you know, 5,000 people where I've had personal conversations with 5,000 people on any given year. And there's no way I could ever remember names. And even faces and context is difficult. So I don't even try anymore. I would have to delete to make room for more information in my brain. We've mentioned uh, books uh, a little earlier on in our conversation. And I wanted to just talk about the – because you've, you've produced and published over 60 books throughout your career, which is an incredible amount of books. What are the comparisons between your latest book and your first one? Because you've obviously – built up a system now for how you develop books but that first one was it something you always wanted to achieve because that's the hardest one presumably the first book yeah you know if the first book was very different than all the ones that uh followed the first book but it got me out the door was a book called indian baskets of the northwest coast indian baskets of the northwest coast and it was because, and it's a, a very long story, but I'll really make it short. I had a climbing instructor right in college. I started climbing, and I had an instructor who happened to also have been the financial director of a hospital in Seattle. And his friend also was the director general of another bigger hospital, and that guy owned a bunch of historic ancient baskets that were priceless. And so my instructor, who was a financial director, put me in contact with this other guy and they were and I was a young photographer looking for work. And so and but I in art school, I took a lot of cultural anthropology and I knew baskets. So I already had the knowledge of Indian, and now we call them First Nations. We would never call them Indians today. But I knew the First Nations culture from the Columbia River all the way up to the Aleutian Islands, nearly to Russia. And so there's like 30 different cultures, and I knew their work. I knew their carvings. I knew their traditions. I knew the baskets. So it was a slam dunk, and it gave me enough income. And, oh, by the way, the director of that hospital bought prints for every hospital room and it gave me enough money to get a car i mean that's how i started out so that first book was really the last time i really did a book like that but it gave me the experience of working with a editor and a publisher and from that then i went on and on and on what is the best mistake you've ever made as a photographer I don't really remember that. I can't, I can't, I, I, clearly I've made a lot of mistakes. Seriously, every, anybody that's alive have made tremendous. But I look only forward and I don't look back with regret. And therefore, I don't have a collection of mistakes or regrets in my brain. I, I guess I could have maybe rephrased that slightly differently. I, when I say mistake, I don't necessarily mean a negative. I'm a huge fan of mistakes because we have to make them in order to learn. Is there something, I guess, is there a mistake that has really taught you something profound that has driven you forward? <laughs> yeah. And um, so thank you for that clarification. The mistakes that I've made and survived, I have applied forward and so many of, and it may still not be along the lines that you're eliciting, but I have made really uh, terrible mistakes on putting myself at harm's way. Um, one of which was walking on the ground in a forest, which the park rules said nobody walks on the ground. But I had a manager of a hotel that assigned some walking guides with me and Gabrielle, and we were ne- nearly killed really closely killed 
uh, by rhinos in Nepal that attacked out of nowhere. And fortunately, and only really fortunately, there was a tree in the forest that had was in the, uh, a fig tree type of forest. And so we were able to dive over the buttress roots that are above the ground. And those roots became a barrier from which the rhino that was trying to gore us and its calf uh, could not get that last, you know, foot and a half to us. And so that was that we would clearly have been killed. Uh, and we found out later 20 people a, di- a year are killed in that park, sneaking in and harvesting firewood from local communities. So these rhinos are aggressive. And we later found out the king of Nepal historically would hunt rhinos. And we n- didn't know any of that history, nor were we, nor would they like to tell people that. But that put us in harm's way. And so that's probably led to the fact that 20 years later, I'm using a pole next to a Komodo dragon rather than trying to crawl up with a wide angle and get it. I see. I see. What is the most important item that you take with you when you travel? Is there something that you won't travel without, apart from the obvious, obviously? If I know I'm going to be dating, potentially dating somebody, I might bring what I normally would bring, which would be handcuffs, a taser, um, this is a joke. Uh, Tabasco, taba- I bring Tabasco along on my trips, a little bottle of Tabasco, uh, uh, a French press, and a bag of freshly ground coffee goes frequently. These are comfort foods. These are what we call comfort items. I brought Tabasco on my Everest expedition because the food was so terrible that Tabasco just at least perked things up. But clothing-wise, camera-wise, I don't think over the years anything was the absolute must. But comfort things like food or like little tiny things that can make a big difference would go along on a trip. I agree with you about coffee as well. Very, very important. Out of um, in- I am. Yeah, coffee is a great drug for me. Out of interest, what kind of equipment will you use for coffee? Will you use an AeroPress or something of that ilk? Well, that's pretty new, and uh, I've been looking at them. I generally have suffi- – I mean, m- most of the places, before I actually go way into the bush, will have an espresso machine. So I'm always on the hunt to make sure there's a little coffee shop nearby that will uh, – yeah, I drink really strong coffee in the morning, and then that's it for the rest of the day. I have a really nice uh, espresso machine in my kitchen. It becomes a ritual in the morning. So I, uh, and I don't drink tequila every night. So, but uh, I need caffeine in the morning to wake me up, and then occasionally alcohol to put me down at night. Yes, likewise. Well, if you've never used an AeroPress, I can highly recommend them. They're very good particularly when traveling with a a stovetop jet boil. They're very good. Um, What We digress, anyway. Good uh, recommendation. Yes, they're very good. What When you put the camera down, I know you said earlier you don't want to, but how would you like you and your work to be remembered? I think longevity and... Uh, uh, being art, uh, being an artist, I think, is the two things that I take most pride in. I think uh, people that have meteoric careers that are flash in the pans, and there's a lot of them. I mean, every day there's the new star, and then a, a year later, in in music, in the humanities, in a lot of different things, they just kind of burn out fast. And to me the greatest personal joy I have is the fact that I'm still doing it 45 years later and just as enthusiastically. And I think that will lead to a longer life, which I want. And so those are the kind of things I self-define myself as just 
being out there doing it still. When a lot of my colleagues have retired or gotten sick and passed away or whatever it may be, I want longevity. Our lives, our lives are short enough, quite honestly. And so, Matthew, in a little over oh, a week from Friday, I will get, get on a plane and I will fly to Miami and I'll fly into Cancun and I'll fly from there to the border with Belize and go out and photograph underwater big American crocodiles in extraordinarily clear water. And theoretically, it's going to be safe, I guess, but I'll be able to get maybe this close to them with a super wide angle with their mouths agape. And I don't ever really think about being injured by an animal. I don't think that's the way I'm going to go out, though that rhino story really was a big wake-up call. But even last year, I had a uh, big brown bear that came up behind me and put its nose in the small of my back. And I had to intimidate this huge bear back away from me by getting aggressive and kind of pushing it. But I knew instantly if the bear wanted to kill me, it would have already done it before I even knew it was there. So they're like elephants. Bears can walk right next to you and you can't hear them. They have big padded feet. And an elephant can walk right next to you and you can't hear an elephant walk. And so this thing walked right up behind me without me even even knowing it. Getting back to the crocodile, I, I really am compelled to bring out a book replete with the drone images I was talking about. And I'm also used little drobies where you can affix a camera to a vehicle and go in and get a perspective that's different. So not uh, if I've done a book on international wildlife before, I want to do something new and different. So I'm pushing myself to doing subjects that I've not done before. And so hence, in a week and a half, in the age of COVID, I'm going to go down with face masks and hand cleaners and try to be as cautious as I can to get the job done and come back. If there was one image that you could display on a billboard that represents you and your work, which image would you use? I think I would use the image that I've talked about a couple of times with Paramal on tequila time, and I'll be showing tomorrow night as my last photo is called Spiritual Journey. Spiritual Journey is the shot of a pilgrim on the Ganga or the Ganges at sunrise. And it was orchestrated. It wasn't just a spontaneous, oh, there's somebody on the boat. It was the pre-visualizing of something that I think could be miraculous. And so because I had been in uh, Varanasi for about four days, and every morning the sun rose as this brilliant red orb, over the river and I knew the following day would be nothing different. And so I, I saw somebody in their boat on the Ganges that had been visiting as part of the pilgrimage during the Kum Mela, this very religious uh, event for the Hindus. And I asked the person to be there 20 minutes before sunrise and would they do that and through the interpreter and they said they would. And so I pulled the boat up into the mud and had them s sit stoically facing away. And then I waited for the sunrise and I, I explained to the person they had to be absolutely still because I was shooting with film, not digital. And I was also shooting with great depth of field so that the boat's foreground was only a couple of inches away but I wanted that in focus all the way to the sun. And so it had to be a very long exposure and it turned out beautifully, but it was pre-visualized and executed. And so I like, and I, because I like the serendipity and I like the spontaneity of shooting wildlife and all that, 
But in this case, it was completely visualized and put together, and it actually turned out really well. And the very fact that I haven't mentioned whether it was a woman or a man is what I also like about the image because you would have no personality, you have no gender, and therefore when people look at that image, they actually can put themselves into the moment because – there's no personality to take them off this direction or that direction. It's a very beautiful image. And I hadn't realized it was shot on film. It was shot in 2001. And it was the year that the trade centers came down. That's why I always remembered that the beginning of the year was so beautiful. And by September, uh, you know, the world went to shit over that. And so I've always remembered that was the same year as the World Trade Center. Okay, I'm going to try some quick-fire questions with you. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and hold you to an answer. So I'm looking for a gut reaction here, whatever, that 50-50, whatever your gut tells you, black and white or color? Both. Both. Okay. Now, I, I started off shooting black and white uh, with a large format, Third, uh, four by fives. Those were the cameras my father photographed weddings with. And so I love black and white. And then color became part of what my background was with painting. And now why I say both is as I go forward, many of the books, I'm working on a book on faith. I would want to design the book with um, black and white as part of it. So I can see it as a design element whether it was shot with black and white. In fact, I, I went over to Africa a couple of years ago and shot Maasai with a uh, Leica monograph camera. So it was a camera dedicated to black and white. People or landscapes? I think people. People because th you're able to tap into people's emotions much stronger when there's a really compelling shot of a fellow human being. And though I love shooting the landscapes that are seem inspirational and all that, I think I can get to the point with a human photograph much more deeply connecting to my audience. I see. I see. Prime or Zoom? I think that um, I don't have a uh, dog in that fight. I think that Zooms are, have become so sharp that I would never be able to tell you, Matthew, if that shot was shot with a prime or a zoom. We all benefit by the technology that's advancing so fast. Yes, and I think you're right in that zoom lenses have progressed leaps and bounds over the last you know, however many years. Uh, film or digital? Definitely digital. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, I think in the first five years that uh, digital came on, many of my colleagues said, I'll never give up my film. I love Velvia. I love this or that. And it's like if you're really smart and know how to use tints and uh, color balance and all that, you can make a Velvia. You can make anything look like the digital or the film capture. And if you're so fanatic that you say there's still a huge, huge difference, maybe – Maybe you are a dinosaur that should be in the Museum of Natural History in London, but to me, the digital is so much superior to film that there's no question in my mind. Do you ever find there is a difference in the quality of image? And I don't mean the, the physical quality. I mean, I've spoken to some photographers that still shoot on film and they say they have a different feeling to the photograph and it's down to the f way that it's taken it's slower it's more considered has that ever been a factor uh, by the way uh, did i ever tell you i was gay i was type a i drank caffeine in the morning and alcohol <laughs> at night i don't give a rat's ass about some photographer that can talk in terms of feeling and all that it's like is it a better technology if so i'm able to get things i never would have been able to do in the past so yeah, I'm not quite that deep <laughs> or what they presume, presume to be deep. I'm about per being productive and able to capture things that we could never have done in the past. And that's definitely digital. 
That is a very, very refreshing answer. Very refreshing indeed. Home, <laughs> home or abroad? And I don't necessarily uh, mean in terms of your work either. Just whatever your gut reaction is to that, really. Yeah, um, I don't see any difference. I think abroad and home is me. The planet is home. I mean, when you see the planet from the moon, that little blue or colorful orb in dark space, that's home. Tripod or handheld? Um, depends on. Yes, of course. Defi yeah, it definitely used to be always tripod. Now there's liabilities with tripods. There's, uh, uh, you know, you do draw more attention to yourself. If fewer people are using tripods, then it becomes more and more noticeable that you've got th those uh, tripod legs when you're trying to be discreet in a different culture. So that's a liability if you bring attention to yourself. And there's a lot of times where you absolutely must use a tripod. You can't get away from it. So it depends on the situation. Okay. Lastly, tequila or coffee? Coffee. Yeah. Excellent answer. I can, live, I can definitely live without alcohol. I don't think I can get up in the morning without coffee. One final question, and it's not uh, either or. If you could jump in the DeLorean, 88 miles an hour, there's a Back to the Future reference for anyone who hasn't seen the film, and spend a day with that 20-year-old, or in fact maybe even younger in your case, that 13-year-old that, <laughs> that was selling prints, what advice would you give to that young man? Um, absolutely follow your heart. You find find a uh, passion, and if you can turn the passion into an avocation, a job, great. If you cannot do that, find the passion first. Find a job that can support the passion. Art Wolf, you have been an absolute joy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. It's been great talking to you. Art, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? I think I'm pretty easily found on um, Facebook, on the Internet, on Instagram. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the right answer. I've never had to find myself, so I don't know how other people do. That was my conversation with the wonderful Art Wolf. A huge, huge thank you to Art for taking the time to come here on the show. And as always, I really hope you enjoyed listening to that wonderful man as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. If you did and you like what we do here at the Standout Photography Show, please leave a review. It takes less than 30 seconds on Apple Podcasts, but it really helps to secure world-class photographers just like Art who have extremely busy schedules. Thank you this week to Zephyr King One, who said, Best photography podcast I've listened to so far. Highly recommend Thank you, Zephyry King One. What a name. If there is anything that sparked your interest during our conversation, and I'm sure there is, visit the standoutcompany.com forward slash podcast. That is the standoutcompany.com forward slash podcast, where you can find links from the episode along with the show notes. For now, thank you as always for joining us. I've been Matthew Walker. He has been none other than Art Wolf and you. You have been sensational. Until next time, take care. 